Well, welcome to Bagel's Bible Study and Brotherhood. We're going to review Acts 15 in this session. You'll notice that there's no Acts 14 posted. That's because I was gone that week and one of the other fellows covered it. I love this cartoon which appeared in Let My People Laugh. We're going to talk about dis uh, disagreements today, particularly about circumcision. But it was a good time for the church. Uh, God had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. That's what it says in Acts uh, for, uh, 14. And the church was doing well. It was growing. And it had been about 10 years since the uh, ascension. Reading verses 1 through 6 in Acts 15, we see certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, Unless you're circumcised according to the customs taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. <laughs> this brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about the question, and the church sent them on their way. And as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, to whom they reported everything that God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, ah, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. Well, these are a group of tra tradition-minded Jews, and they're, uh, they're criticizing the, the people for not requiring circumcision to become Christians. And this is more than a disagreement we might see between the 8 o'clock service and the 11 o'clock service about the music they play. This is an honest concern and interpretation of their history and interpretation of, of their theology. So let's look at that briefly. In Genesis 12, uh, they uh, promised, uh, God promised to Abram, I will make you a, um, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and you will be a blessing and all the people of the earth will be blessed through you. So based on this promise and God's command, Abram left Haran and went down south to the promised land. And later in Genesis 15, Abram had a vision where God promised him a son and he said, the son will be your flesh and blood and he will be your heir. Well, upon God's direction, Abram then split some sacrificial animals so that the blood would run between them, and Abram fell asleep, and God walked through this. We, we know that the, the light and the candle went through this, representing God, and it was a unilateral covenant. Normally, two people would walk through the middle, get blood on their feet, and that was a, a blood oath that they would perform the covenant or suffer the consequences of blood. But in this case, God made a unilateral covenant, and he said, to your descendants, I give this land. Now, in Abram's eyes, you can't have descendants without having a son. And where was the son? So in 16, uh, 11 years after they entered the promised land, when he was 86 years old, he had a son, Ishmael, uh, and he was uh, born of Hagar, who was Sarah's servant. He was not a son of the prof uh, promise. It was just more of a son of impatience. And God uh, said, um, he had promised him the land. I'm pointing this out. Um, but he said that uh, Ishmael would be a donkey or a wild donkey of a man. And uh, this has been a problem ever since, uh, that his hand would be against everyone. And then in Genesis 17, he said, uh, again, you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. And God changed his name from Abra Abram, which is exalted father, to Abraham, which is father of a multitude. And the covenant between God and Abraham and his offspring 
was made, and God said, You are to undergo circumcision, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. For the generations to come, every male among you must be circumcised. And that's the way it's been for centuries with those chosen by God, that is, the Jews. God chose the Jews, and now God is choosing the Gentiles. So, in a way, it's not reasonable that a Gentile um, not be circumcised if he's to become one of the chosen people. That would be their point of view. It was a righteous concern, and it needed to be discussed. It's actually a legalism argument, too. Now, in um, Acts 15, 7 through 11, after much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. And he did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe that it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. Well, whenever you have two or more people, there's always going to be a difference of opinion. That's just the way people are. And these verses give us somewhat of a model of dissension of church uh, in the church or in the office and how it should be handled. The essence is, how can we cooperate in our standards, remain faithful to God, and preserve the essence of Christianity. Well, here's some observations I made about what happened. It's what I learned. Let's begin with verse 7. It says, after much discussion. Well, all parties should be allowed to voice their opinion. Get it off the chest, so to speak. Vent their frustration. Sometimes their own arguments will self-destruct when made public. We've seen that on the news. They need to be heard fully and thoughtfully, and you need to meet, meet you need to meet face to face publicly at a prescribed time and place so it's available to people, and exclude outside distractions so that neither side can complain that they were not heard. The venue should include the authorities with the decision making power, but we don't want to hear from the authorities at the first. It's a little like in the military. I sat on a court-martial, and when you're making the decision, you start from the lowest-ranking officer going up in rank. That way, the lower ranks are not intimidated in their opinion by those of senior rank. So, having the authorities there, though, gives importance, or it recognizes the importance of the objections that are being made. And you need to discuss the issue thoroughly. Uh, that means speaking in a modulated voice and allowing systematic give and take. Uh, it implies mutual respect, thoughtful listening, and careful consideration. The dissenters need to say their piece. And just a final reminder, it's not about me, it's not about you, it's about what God wants us to do. Thus, there should be no winners and no losers. And when people are allowed to present their side, uh, there's less argument and more cooperation. So the second thing is effective counterpoint begins with a simple statement of truth about which both sides can agree, and it focuses on what we know and agree. So in 7 it says, Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. They knew this. 
And it was nice that uh, they were addressed as brother. It brings people together when you show respect. Um, the focus now is on what God had done, like it or not. And we need to respond to him, not to us. It includes a common starting point and a common goal, that is to resolve the difficult situation. And the next step is to succinctly give the strongest unassailable argument to support your position. In 8 it says, God who knows the heart showed that he has accepted them, that's the Gentiles, by giving the Holy Spirit to them just as he did to us. So God accepted the Gentiles. Who are we to argue? God gave the Gentiles his spirit. Who are we to argue? God gave us his spirit. Doesn't that make us spiritual equals, regardless of the circumcision? The next step is to challenge the opposing person's position with an objective measure of success for uh, his position, measured in time or fact. We're not trying to step on their toes, uh, but we need to look at scripture, see if there's a precedent or even in tradition. Is there some evidence of God's hand in this situation? It's not a matter of reason or desire that dictates what is God's will or truth. It's how God has manifest himself in this situation. So in nine, it says, he did not discriminate between us and them for he purified their hearts by faith. That is, between the Gentiles and the Jews. He purified their hearts by faith. So, we summarize our position succinctly and then shut up. How is God at work here? It's good to use Jesus' method. Ask a question that illuminates the right decision. In verse 10, he says, Now then, why do you test God by putting on the necks of the Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors had been able to bear. No one was able to bear the yoke that God had put on them. How could they expect the Gentiles, who had none of the traditions of the Jews, to be able to do it? So the question before the council was, can anybody be saved if not circumcised? Well, this is akin to a question that I hear regularly, particularly at the jail, and the question is, can anyone be saved if not baptized? I'll leave that for a later discussion. But it's time now in this process to back up their arguments with signs from God. So, in Acts 15, 12 to 20, we read, The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. And when they finished, Jesus, I'm sorry, when they finished, James spoke, spoke up and said, Brothers, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God had first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophet are in agreement with this, as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild, and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from meat strangle, of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest of times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. Well, the signs and wonders that Paul and Barnabas described reinforced the fact that the Holy Spirit was being poured out on the Gentiles. It reinforced the arguments of Peter, and it helped to convince the dissenting Jews. 
Then James had just sealed the deal by referring to scripture, and he quoted from the book of Amos. Now, Amos is a book in which there's universal judgment by God, and it has the first six chapters, judgment oracles, and then three chapters of impending judgment or visions. But it does end with uh, 9-11. In the NIV, it titles that subsection, The Restoration of Israel. And I think that's particularly interesting because Israel, when they divided the northern kingdom from the southern kingdom under Jeroboam, they wanted to wipe out all reference to David. <clears throat> uh, they didn't want people to have a reason to go back to Jerusalem. And so they wanted to make themselves totally independent. And here, uh, God would bless his people through J David. That's the promise that God gave, that there would be uh, an eternal throne with an eternal person on his throne. And Israel would be re restored and judgment would not be final, but it would be a tool through which blessings would come. And it says in there that God would return and rebuild David's tent. And that began with Jesus' resurrection and then his reign. And all Gentiles will bear the name of Jesus. Now, one little detail in here I think is interesting. There are three merisms. And a merism is where there are words that are similar but different. They're opposites. An uh, example would be body and soul or life and death. Well, in this case, it's a booth and nation. The booth of David will be restored and the nation would be blessed. That is, the Gentiles would be blessed. <clears throat> And then uh, the, James offered a compromise, and he gave four rules of conduct instead of the law that they should abstain from food polluted by idols, sexual immorality, meat of strangled animals, and blood. And these are known as the apostolic decree. Now, people have tried for a long time to find a common thread that binds them together. Why these four? Well, honestly, I don't find a really good one, but let's look at some of the arguments. Uh, some have argued that uh, the pagans strangled animals as part of the sacrificial system, and they claim that it tasted better to leave the blood in the animal. But I don't find a lot of evidence for this practice. And also, when it forbids eating meat that's polluted by idols, that kind of covers it. Now, David Instone Brewster... Um, may an argument that it's not strangled, but smothered, that the word is better translated that way. And it's a prescription against smothering, especially children. You see, this was a time when the method of birth control commonly used, particularly by the Romans and the Greeks, was um, exposure. They would put the child out and let them just die, or they'd strangle them. Um, infanticide was widely accepted among the Romans and Greeks. Now, um, some argue that uh, these rules were to make it so the people, the Gentiles, would know how to eat with the Jews. Uh, and idol offerings, obviously you would bring meat from an idol, and blood needed to be properly drained. And then I read that people said, well, a woman shouldn't prepare food while she's in her menses. Really? You're going to ask her if she's menstruating? I don't know. Plus, the word in Greek that's used there is pornea, from which we get pornography. I think that speaks for itself. Now, others argue that it's to avoid the immorality of the Gentile world, and of course, idol offerings would do that. And the blood, well, what about blood from a rare steak? Well, that's really a specious argument because that blood is myoglobin and it really is not blood. But we're to avoid bloodshed and violence especially including smothering or infanticide. And, of course, sexual immorality. Um, that would point to a pornea or going to prostitutes or to homosexual practice. And that was something that was quite accepted by the Romans. So, really, the most important question is, what is sexual immorality? How do you define it? Well, for the Jews, it was fairly easy. Leviticus 18 gave a good summary of the prohibitions. Um, the problem is the culture of the day. The Romans and Greeks practiced homosexuality, and particularly nobility were promiscuous. So uh, they wouldn't 
really like a lot of these uh, limitations, so to speak. Now, they could argue that Jesus had fulfilled the law, and so weren't the Old Testament prohibitions removed, but uh, that would be like saying, can't culture define morality? Not so. Jesus himself said even the contemplation of sex outside of marriage was a sin. And Jesus echoed the high view of uh, sexual intercourse. So what is sexual immorality? Well, the current thinking or the, the traditional thinking is that we were made in the image of God. We were made for a purpose, and that purpose was to have fellowship with God. We were made to have and to teach our progeny how to have fellowship with God. And with this, intercourse is a blessing, and uh, it was a means to an end. Conduct outside those limitations um, subverted God's purpose, and that subversion we call sin. Now, I'm going to bring up a maybe a little bit of a touchy subject. Um, what about gender dysphoria? At the, outset, at the outset, let me say that the whole idea of transgenderism kind of gave me the willies. But I was convicted by an article in this month's Christianity Today, that would be July in 2015, and... Uh, Let's first define a few terms. Gender identity is how one experiences themselves as a male or female and includes uh, how they feel. But the emphasis is more turned now towards um, their discomfort, dysphoria that they experience because of problems with their gender. So the definition of gender dysphoria is a deep and abiding discomfort over the incongruence between their biological sex and their psychological emotional experience of the gender. Let me just say that again. A deep and abiding discomfort over the incongruence between their biological sex and their psychological and emotional experience of gender. Now, this is not about having sex or an attraction to the same sex. It's not sexual as we think of it normally between people. It's a mismatch between an individual's psychology and an individual's biology. Uh, why this happens, we don't know. It, we just don't know. How often does it happen? Well, the incident appears to be 0.014% of men and 0.003% of women, but it's believed that underestimates uh, the incidence because many people kind of live with what they have. So there's a continuum between male and female and their experience and the distress that they feel or the impairment they feel. And those with a milder form may just cross-dress or act out in private their concerns. And the other end of the spectrum are those who go through gender reassignment. Um, so it's thought that uh, if you include all of these people, maybe the incidence is 0.5% compared to the incidence of gay and lesbians at 2 to 4%. So there's a spectrum of behavior. On one end, you have those who live their biological gender, and then next you might have the cross-dressers, and then those who go through gender reassignment, and then some have an unresolved conflict, and modern therapy doesn't help very much. Now, uh, Mark Yarhouse, he's a Christian professor and psychologist at Regent University writes in this article uh, that there are three cultural lenses viewed uh, uh, used to view gender dysphoria and these help explain our reaction to the condition and the individual. So this is our way of viewing the problem. And the first lens is the integrity lens and it views the gender as a sacred ident integrity of maleness and femaleness, and is stamped on one's body. It can't be changed. And cross-gender identification threatens to dishonor the creational order of male and female. And they bolster this view with Deuteronomy 
22 5 uh, where it says that a woman must not wear men's clothing nor a man wear women's clothing for the Lord your God detests anyone who does this in Deuteronomy 23 1 it says no one who has been emasculated by crushing or cutting may enter the assembly of the Lord now people who see through uh, integrity lenses are very concerned that um, cross-gender identification moves against the integrity of one's biological sex and it violates an essential aspect of personhood. Some people though are able to put gender dysphoria into a different category from homosexuality even though they struggle with uh, reassignment surgery. Now the second lens, where well, the first one is identity, the second one is disability, and these people view uh, gender dysphoria as the problem is we're living in a fallen world. It's not a direct result of a moral choice, and they're not culpable. They can't help the fact they were born that way. They truly were born that way in the disability lens. And so it makes room for being supportive uh, in a way, at least at the identity, the integrity, gen, let me say it again, it allows supportive concern where the integrity lens does not allow that. So we have integrity lens, disability lens, and the third one is diversity. And it sees it as something to be celebrated, honored, revered. That's where our society is moving. We see it every day in the news. Uh, some with uh, wish to recast sex as a socially constructed idea of gender. Well, this does answer the question is, who am I? And it provides acceptance and allows one to find purpose in life. The woman on the right wrote of her experiences as her brother underwent gender reassignment surgery to become her sister. I found the article to be quite perceptive, and in my group, I'm sending a copy of it to each person. It opened my eyes. And the question then we really need to tackle, the important question, is what should we do as Christians? Now, in this article, they collected 32 Christians who were biological males, but were transitioned to females. They were asked, what kind of support would you have liked to have from the church? And this was a response. Someone to cry with me rather than denounce me. Hey, it's scary to see God not rescue someone from cancer or schizophrenia or gender dysphoria. But learn to allow your compassion to overcome your fear and repulsion. Now, with the integrity lens, we might be able, or we might be tempted to shout, act your sex, ignore the discomfort. With the disability lens, we might be tempted to shout, compassion. With the diversity lens, we might shout, celebrate. Well, I, for one, have begun to switch from the integrity lens to the disability lens. I've learned that it's not a sexual perversion as much as it is a confusion, a discomfort. The only problem is that both the disability and the diversity lenses, to one degree or another, assert that the creational goodness of maleness or femaleness can be discarded. It's more important, though, to focus on the concept of redemption. And redemption is not found by measuring how well a person's gender identity aligns with their biological sex. Redemption is found by drawing them to the person and the work of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us in his image. So, what to do? When Sarah walks into our church and looks like a man on the left and is dressed like a woman, she will be asking herself, 
Am I welcome here? If Shara shares, if Shara shares her name, use it. Sarah, use the female pronoun she and her, not him. It's an act of respect to use their name and their gender pronoun. And if we can't grant them respect, it'll be impossible to establish a relationship, impossible to love well. We must be seen with her. We must sit with her, just as we would with an adulterer, a liar, or any other sinner out there. We're not identifying with her, but we're simply loving well. Well, that ends the lesson. I like to end the lesson with a true short story. Perhaps it highlights some aspect of the lesson. I call it news you might have missed. In 2004, there was a mother who had seven children not one of them was baptized, and she said it was because it was too expensive to have all of her, the godparents present. An excuse in a storm. Her minister uh, offered to baptize the children in his chapel after a brief introduction to the faith. And then afterwards, uh, he shared sandwiches that he had prepared and soft drinks to celebrate. He liked to cook, and he cooked often for the poor. It, the mother was just not used to being welcomed by the church. And she said, I can't believe it. You make me feel so important. And he said, but lady, where do I come in? It's Jesus who makes you important. Well, that was years ago in a poor suburb of Buenos Aires. You might know the priest as Father Berglio or as Pope Francis, a good example of how to love well. May God bless you.